Good morning, church. I, um, I want to dive into this message here in just a moment, but I just want you to um, join me in a word of thanks for this last week, many of us gathered with family and friends as we were allowed uh, in our homes in different places, but we have a team of people uh, that were a part of transforming the church last Sunday at right after church, and then an amazing team that has spent over 200 hours building the set you see before you right now. Could we just give thanks to God for their great efforts? Wow. Wow. The worship this morning was fantastic. Uh, I, um, I've been in places before where you felt like when you got up to preach, you had to like try to bring the plane up because it was kind of diving at that point in the service. Uh, I feel like I'm catching it high today in this place. And my, my word, uh, what a beautiful um, morning to be together or evening for wherever you're watching around the world. And we are so grateful that you are here uh, in this journey that we begin called Christmas Past. And this, this journey with Christmas past, we're going to be talking about uh, the, these main themes that are seeded throughout history that we will be enjoying as we light the candles, uh, normally of an Advent wreath. This is our version of an Advent wreath here at Clear Branch. And as we light the candles of hope and of peace and of joy and of love and ultimately the Christ candle on Christmas Eve. So the first two weeks, we're really going to center mainly on what is yet to come. Jesus came into the world and he said, I'm coming again as his last words to the disciples. I'll be coming again. It is our hope this morning of what Christ has promised is yet to come. And, and, and we'll be spending time in that place really in the hope that is yet to come and also in the peace that is yet to come because of the promises of God that are yet to be fulfilled. And so we'll be living in that place these first two weeks between uh, hope and peace. And then the second two weeks will really be mainly kind of getting our hearts ready as we today in the season of Advent make our, begin our journey to a manger where we'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths. And in this journey, as we walk on this, it's a season, Advent is a season for those of you that have not grown up in church or around that terminology that may be new to you. It's a season of anticipation. It's a season of repentance. It's a season of adventure. It's a beginning. It's a newness where we remember that 2,000 years ago that Christ came and put on flesh and was placed in a manger. He, he came to us because we couldn't get to him. And as we make this journey, and on Christmas Eve, you heard the announcement tonight that for the first time in many, many years, we'll have two Christmas Eve services that we're going to ask you to register for so that we can wisely and safely gather as a body in, at four and at six o'clock on that night. We're asking you to reserve your spot so we can make sure as we celebrate with carols and candles and communion that we can do that in a way that is safe and why. So if you'll be sure to get, get online there on the on Clear Branch uh, website and uh, get your spot reserved for that. This season reminds us that the kingdom of God is already here and that the kingdom of God is not yet fully here. Scripture tells us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. That day has not yet come. The kingdom is not yet fully here. And today we're going to live, I believe you could almost live all of the birth story of Christ, the life story of Christ, even the death of Christ. You could almost find every bit of his life in the book of Isaiah. In the Old Testament, there's this wonderful prophet. There are five major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Then there are 12 minor prophets. And in those prophets, you can find uh, much about the birth, the life, the miracles, the death, even how he rode into Jerusalem and how he died on a cross and how they would gamble for his clothing. All of those things you can find prophesied in the Old Testament, in particular in the book of Isaiah. And today we're going to be hanging out in the 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah, the first 11 verses. And today as I read the scripture, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to begin with verse 8 through 11, and then we'll back in to those first verses as well. Isaiah 40 verses 8 through 11, hear the word of God. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, hear of good news. 
lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. And behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd and he will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. If, if I could take all of today's message and put it in one sentence, uh, the, the message title is, Why Can We Hope? Why can we hope? And the big theme that I want you to get out of this message today, that if someone asks you at lunch today or later this week or any time in the future, that first message of Advent, what was the main thing about that? What was it about hope? Why can we hope? Here's what I want you to be able to share from the depths of your soul and being. Hope comes from what will last over what will pass. Hope comes from what will last over what will pass. Would you just say that with me? Hope comes from what will last over what will pass. Friends, if we can get this today, it'll change the way that we live. It'll change where we focus our time and our energies and our passions. And the first part of this message, I just simply want it to be this. Hope for what is coming. Here again, verses 1 through 5 in Isaiah 40. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I want to invite you to think with me for a moment. As a child, see if you don't resonate with this. As a child, I remember vividly when my grandparents from out of town were coming to visit. And whenever they were coming to visit, just once or twice a year perhaps, there was a, there was a routine that happened in our house. My mom would kick into overdrive. And it was time to get the house ready. And I don't mean just like stuff everything under the bed or shove everything into the closets. I'm talking about uh, clean off uh, the drapes and clean off the, uh, all the shades on the lamps. I'm talking about vacuum the floors, wax the kitchen, the linoleum uh, that was there. Uh, get everything perfectly ready, perfectly clean. It was time to light candles so the house would smell good. Maybe even bake some cookies so as they walked in the door, it would smell like Betty Crocker had visited too. It was time for us to, to get out the good plates. You know what I mean? Get out the good plates that were hidden in that closet or that pantry or that cabinet at most of the year. But they were coming. Someone special was coming. We were making preparations, getting ready. It was what was yet to come. Then they would show up. Oh, it was just joyful. There's grandma and grandpa. And they would always say, oh, look how you've grown. I think you've grown six inches since I last saw you. And I would perk up and stand up so excited. There was a preparation, and I just wonder this morning if, if we don't find ourselves in a time of year where we recognize that we're called to prepare for the coming of Christ. This time where Christ it has promised that he's coming into the world, not only is, is the life of Jesus prophesied throughout all the prophets of the Old Testament, especially in the book of Isaiah, but so too John the Baptist. Remember that in the first chapter, uh, actually, let me just remind you of this. Matthew and Luke are the only two gospels which record the birth of Christ. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four gospels, all record these words about John the Baptist. Every one of them quotes him in this way. The voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. 
It's a direct quote out of this chapter that we're sharing today, Isaiah 40, verse 3. That's a direct quote out of Isaiah. When Isaiah said it, it was because they were going to be coming out of a time that, the, that God was going to heal their land. He was going to move back in. And, and 70 years they'd been in exile. And they were excited because that season of exile was coming to an end. And they were preparing for the presence of God to come back into the camp. But for John the Baptist to say it, he was the cousin of Jesus, had been walking with Jesus for several years by the time the public ministry of Jesus would come about. He was, he was saying, I know who this guy is. Prepare the, the road. Prepare, as a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the road for the one who will walk in whose sandals I'm not worthy to tie or untie. You see, a prophet always points out the sin that is immediate. And the future that is coming. That's exactly what Isaiah was doing here in verse in chapter 40, uh, verse 3. The first five verses have shared the hope that they can know, the Israelites can know, because they're coming out of exile. And it's also the same hope that that John the Baptist would be speaking of as after 400 years, there had been a time walking in the darkness and walking in the wilderness where he was saying, The light of Christ has come, the glory of God is here. And we are, who have been living in the wilderness are called to walk in the wilderness no more. John the Baptist himself actually had lived most of his life in Qumran, a wilderness place down by the Dead Sea, uh, the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were actually discovered. And he had experienced the light and the power of the presence of Christ. What Isaiah was pointing to here in verse 3 of chapter 40 of Isaiah is, is that God's glory that the Lord and the Lord's glory were coming. It's the same thing that John the Baptist was pointing to, where the valley's being lifted up and the mountains being lowered down. You see, that's what happened when dignitaries came to town. They would literally make the road smooth before them. The rocky places would be hewn out. The, the mountains would be lowered down so they didn't have to go up over mountain ranges. The valleys would be brought up so they didn't have to go down through valleys. It was a level ground all the way so they could welcome in that royal person into their community and their context. Are we preparing our hearts and our lives for the coming of Christ this year? Are are we doing that? Our way of saying it today would be, we're gonna roll out the red carpet to make a space for you. And the way that John the Baptist would say it is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom came because the king of heaven came to earth. You see, they and we They hoped and we hope for what is yet coming. Jesus said, not only did I come, but I'm coming again. And why why can we believe that he, when he said he's coming again, why can we believe it's true? Because when it was prophesied to Israel back in the book of Isaiah that they would be coming out of exile, they came out of exile. And when it was prophesied that Jesus would be coming throughout the Old Testament, Jesus came into the world. He, you see, if, if I tell you something, if I was to hold up a $20 bill here this morning and I was to say the first person who gets to the stage gets the $20 bill, someone might saunter down and take it. But if I then took out right after that and they went back to their seat and I said, here's a $100 bill, the first person who gets to the stage gets the $100 bill, I think there'd be more than one or two people running to the stage. Because if it happened the first time, we can counter it happening the second time. And then again, we can count on the word of the Lord. What he says is true. Here verses 6 through 8 from Isaiah 40. We hope not only for what is coming, but we also hope for what has already come. Hear the word. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the breath, when the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely people are but grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Notice that in Isaiah 40 verse 3, uh, the voice that's crying in the wilderness is a man. The first time it's the man Isaiah, the second time it's the man John the Baptist. But here in verses 6 through 8, the cry is actually coming from the Lord. It's describing the difference between what will last And what will pass? Flowers and grass wither and fade, but the word of the Lord will remain forever. 
Hear, hear me this morning. This, this is the part I got so excited about this week as I was studying and preparing to bring this message with you. This too shall pass. If you're in a season of school that is difficult, I was praying with someone this morning uh, about a season of school that's stressful and they've got uh, a lot of tests coming up that they're nervous about right now. Hey, this too shall pass. If you're in a season of training for a sport or a job to get in shape and you're making sacrifices with, with your eating or your exercising, take courage. This too shall pass. If you have a baby at home, we got lots of babies in our Clear Branch family right now, and I love babies. And for those of you who have babies in the room right now, uh, don't you worry if they start crying. I think it's one of the most beautiful sounds in the whole wide world. I'm not saying poke them to make them do it, okay? But um, I love being in a church filled with babies. But I know this, if you've got a baby at home, there's not a lot of sleep happening, especially a new young baby. There's not a lot of sleeping. Take heart. This too shall pass. If you're caring for an elderly parent and you feel like this is really hard, the one who took care of me, now I'm taking care of them, be of good courage. This too shall pass. If you're in a season of paying off debt or saving for a big purchase and having to make financial sacrifices to do so, have rice and beans, beans and rice, as Dave Ramsey would say, have, this too shall pass. If COVID-19, hello, if it feels like it's going to be here forever, I don't know if it's a day or a week or a month or a quarter or how much longer, but let me promise you this, friends, in Jesus' name, this too shall pass. Hallelujah. It's a season. Now the season's lasted longer than we want it to. It's carried on further than we intended for it to. But it will pass. If you're in your hardest season of school or work or family or friends or breakups or downsizes or cold sores. I used to say cold sores were to help us appreciate when we don't have cold sores. Allergies were to help us appreciate when they clear up. Voice changes, I get so tickled listening to our teens sometimes and they'll be talking and, 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 and it shoots me right back to when I was a teen and that voice was changing and breaking. And bad hair days, aches, pains, worsening hearing, vision or memory. Be encouraged, this too shall pass. As a matter of fact, in an address to the, the Wisconsin State Agricultural Society of 1859, Abraham Lincoln, one of our great presidents, illustrated the profound and tempering effect that this statement can make. He told of an Eastern monarch who gave his counselors an assignment to come up with a truth that would apply to all times and all situations. And after careful consideration, they returned with this one sentence, and this too shall pass away. Lincoln said, and this statement, this statement has a chastening effect in our hour of pride where we're feeling really good about ourselves. And it has a consoling effect in our hour of affliction. If you're in a difficult season, friends, be comforted by these words. This too shall pass. If you're in a wonderful season... <laughs> Be of good cheer, but be aware, this too shall pass. Everyone swapping places at the timeshare or at the Disney hotel or on the great vacation spot knows this truth because the people going in have the joy of anticipation of what's coming. The people coming out have the pain of knowing is over. This too shall pass. In 1983, I did my first recording session singing Back Up for Sandy Patty at Gaither Studios. Over the course of two weeks, I made nearly $200. Actually, it was almost $300. And in, in, in those two weeks, I made almost $300. That is, in today's present value, about a million dollars in my life. I thought I was the richest person on planet Earth. I, it was my very first time being in the studio, and, and I was getting paid to do something I loved. It was amazing. And I got, got that $300 check at two ninety seven, dollars and, and, and I cashed it, and I put it all in my little wallet. I, actually, I, I think I had $100 bill, and the rest were ones. My, I mean, it was about that thick. 
It was incredible. I thought I owned the world. I spent a lot of time at the mall over the next couple of months. I think I set new high scores on Pac-Man and Galaga and Donkey Kong and Space Invaders. I, I mean, I, I was the man at the arcade. Not only that, but I found the candy store had every kind of candy I liked too. I ate my personal weight in Boston baked beans and lemon heads. And my personal favorite, Jordan almonds. I mean, I put it, I mean, I ate them and ate them and ate them till I was just sick at my stomach. Now, in those days, I ate all of that without ever gaining a pound. Just then when I swallowed my spit, I gained two pounds. Yeah. It was wonderful. But you know what I learned that summer? I learned at the end of that summer that I blew through all $297 without a thing other than some trips to the dentist to fill cavities to show for it. I mean, it, it faded so fast. It was faster than chiclet chewing gum flavor. I mean, it was here and gone that fast. The, the world is filled, friends, hear me. The world is filled with things that will pass, pass but it's sustained by Two things that last. God's word and the things done in God's name. By God's word, who God says you are, who God says he is, that will last. And who God's called you to be in the world for him, the things that you do in his name, that will last. But everything else, friends, it's gonna, it's gonna pass. The world will come and pass away. But our hope in Christ is eternal. Too often we're putting our attention on temporary things that will pass when God is calling us to focus our heart and mind on the things of Christ that will last. This morning, I just wonder, are we hoping because of what's yet to come? We can. Those who are in Christ can hope that he's coming again. Are we hoping in what, that he's already come that his word is true and sure and we can count on it. But I believe today scripture gives us one more piece that I don't want you to miss. And that is that we can hope in the shepherd's arms. Hear these verses again this morning. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. You see, God's presence brings presence. Some of you would say today, way more important than anything that a loved one would come and bring and give to you. You don't need another tie. You don't need another blanket. You don't need another pair of shoes. You don't need another garden tool. What you need is to be in the presence of those that you love. It's far more important than any gift they can give to you right now. Unless you're that sixth grade boy like me that was really more focused on Jordan almonds and baked Boston baked beans and lemon heads. If you're maturing in your life and your faith, what you long for is to be in the presence of those you love. And that presence will take care of everything else. The phrase, I love this phrase, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms it's a theme that goes all throughout the scriptures. It's the theme that we get when we read the 23rd Psalm and we say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We could really stop there because the rest of the 23rd Psalm is encapsulated in that one verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have all that I need in him, in his presence, in his arms being wrapped around me. In, in the book of Isaiah, this theme is, is told like 20 times. The arms of the shepherd are described in vivid detail in Isaiah 51.5 and 52.10 and 53.1 and 59.1. And you can go back and watch this to catch all these. And 59.16 and 60 verse 4 and 62 verse 8, 63 verse 5, 63 verse 12. In each of these verses, 
the strong and mighty arm of the great shepherd is able to provide and protect and save. The description wasn't just for the Israelites. It was for you and for me. The shepherd theme is carried all the way through the scriptures and it's the perfect reason for us to hope as we begin Advent, as we begin Advent here today. You may feel like a sheep that has wandered lost or a sheep that has fallen ill or fallen in a hole. You may feel like a sheep that is in danger, but hear me, I assure you of this. You have a shepherd who is willing and able to save, guide, lift, and hold. The hope of Advent, the hope of Advent centers in this. We have a shepherd who came, is coming again, and whose arms are strong enough to hold us all. That's the hope of Advent. And that shepherd invites us to focus on what will last and not what will pass. Let's pray. Jesus, help us to recognize where your kingdom is already here and to work to bring it where it is not yet visible. Convict us for the places we need to repent and prepare such that the, the mountains might be humbled and brought low and the valleys might be lifted and raised up. Forgive us for focusing too much of our attention and our resources on the things that will pass away as quickly as those Jordan almonds, and Boston baked beans, and lemon heads. Impassion us to center our lives and our hope on the things that will last, on your word and your promises that are eternally true. And God, if there's anyone in earshot of my voice right now that has never entered into the arms of the shepherd, anyone who in earshot of my voice in this room or watching online right now, Lord, who has never come under the wings of the shepherd, the care of the great shepherd of the sheep, God, I pray, I ask that they would call upon you right now. As a matter of fact, if that's you today, I just want to give you that chance right here, right now. If you've never called upon the shepherd of the sheep, would you just pray with me this prayer? Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of your grace. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I believe in you as my Savior, the one who rescues me. And I ask you to be the Lord of my life, the one in charge. I ask you to be my shepherd, and I commit to be your sheep. And God, today I ask that you would help us to center on the things that last and not the things that will pass so that our hope would be fulfilled in you. And we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. As the, as the band sings this one last song that I'm going to come up with a challenge for you before you go out today. I just want to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer today, if you're in the room and prayed that prayer, if you're watching online and prayed that prayer, uh, I want to invite you today to, as I'll be at the doors as you go out today, and I'll be available all this week if you want to talk and pray, if you want to have an opportunity to make a public profession of what you've done privately in your heart. And we'll have baptisms next Sunday, and we'll have the opportunity for people to join the church next Sunday. You can do both if that's uh, got something God has laid on your heart to do. We're going to sing this song that I love, O come, O come, Emmanuel, you are our hope. Let's stand as we do.